In India and many of the surrounding countries today, ethnically speaking, the majority of the population belongs to one of the many Indo-Aryan people groups, the furthest eastern half of the Indo-European family. However, to the south, the people speak a highly divergent language family called Dravidian, a term derived from ancient Sanskrit, not known to be related to any other group in the world so far. And although there is considerable overlap in the culture and heritage between Dravidians and Indo-Aryans, South Asians are well aware of many of the general societal differences between the two peoples, which usually delineates the demarcation between North and South. So is there such thing as the Dravidian race? The answer, as in most anthropological issues, is far more complicated than people give it credit for or would like to think. Many anthropologists are split, but almost no one in the professional field ever uses the term Dravidian race to describe this people group, as it's not entirely accurate. The Dravidians are an ethno-linguistic group in the same manner as Slavs or Bantus or indeed the Indo-Aryans, yet they have a very distinguished racial origin that have confounded Indian and Western scholars for years with conflicting, oftentimes politically charged explanations. The oldest known evidence to the origins of the Dravidian family is a dialect coined as Harappan, spoken roughly five to 6,000 years ago in Milaha, or the Indus Valley Civilization in modern India and Pakistan, which, if not a member of the Dravidian language family itself, most likely diverged from it in the not too distant past, and it's even been proposed they could have been further related to either Elamite, a language isolate formerly located in southern Iran, or possibly even Sumerian in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, another language isolate, although Elamite has the most professional credibility, though not entirely confirmed. Whatever the case, it would appear that the ancestors of the Dravidians were descended from old western Eurasians and intermarried with the original inhabitants of the subcontinent who could have belonged to a number of ethno-linguistic groups, yet were physically and genetically distinct from western or eastern Eurasians, a group dubbed as Australoid, Vedoid, or simply Southern Eurasian. The Australoid type, despite their surface level similarities to Sub-Saharan Africans, are much more closely related genetically to Eastern Eurasians from whom they split off from a couple tens of thousands of years ago after their exit from Africa. And because of genetic drift, these groups are actually the most genetically disparate from Africans than all other races. It only makes sense considering they were some of the first migrants to leave the continent, mostly traveling along the coastline of the Indian Ocean, settling in the Arabian Peninsula, South Asia, and the lost landmasses of Sundaland, a large landmass that encompassed Southeast Asia, and Sahul, a large island connecting Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea. So it would appear that the bulk of Dravidians, even before the arrival of the Indo-Aryans in the north, definitely had genetic connections to ancient Middle Easterners and haplogroups that are associated with the ancestral South Indian population are those that belong to the original Australoid population, as well as those brought by the Dravidian migrants from their original homeland. The most obvious example of indigenous South Asians predating any known migrations would have to be the Sri Lankan Vedas. The Vedas of Sri Lanka are accepted to be members of the indigenous race of Sri Lanka even before the Dravidian Tamils or Indo-Aryan Sinhalese and have a quite noteworthy appearance being the purest example of pre-Western Eurasian migration, at least to Sri Lanka, being very similar to the Australian Aborigines in appearance with quite a large brow ridge, wide set nostrils, and quite coarse hair. Although linguistically assimilated into the Sri Lankan society, they formerly spoke a language distinct from the Dravidian, Indo-Aryan, or Austroasiatic languages, which has as of yet not been identified due to only fragments appearing in the Veda language, described as a mix of Sinhalese and their original mystery language. Horn Africans such as Cushitic and Habesha groups also have quite the distinct look, having a large amount of admixture from ancient and newer migrants from Eurasia and North Africa, thus developing their own phenotype over thousands of years. And some say that the Habeshas, especially Eritreans, have a certain physical affinity to South Indians and are often mistaken as such. 
If it wasn't for their naturally curly hair, they probably wouldn't even be considered the same race as other sub-Saharan Africans at all in mainstream vernacular, which is why earlier anthropologists basing their observations mostly off skull shape and body type classified Horn Africans and Dravidians under the Caucasian racial group, albeit with heavy African and Australoid admixture respectively. Additionally, if you look at people of partial Aborigine, Papuan, or Melanesian ancestry, especially those of part European or Asian heritage as well, it becomes very clear to see the origins of the subcontinent, as they have a striking resemblance to South Asians, which is suggestive of their origins as the fusing of the basal Western, Eastern, and Southern Eurasians. Now, there is the question of whether there has always been phenotypic differences between the people of North and South India, and that's certainly more difficult to answer and definitely more of a touchy subject. However, we can say without a doubt there would have been at least some degree of variation in genetics and appearance throughout the region before the development of the two dominant cultures we see there today. The Andamanese, a southern Eurasian group isolated for tens of thousands of years on the Andaman Islands, clearly have a different phenotype than the indigenous Aslians of Malaysia's interior, the Negritos of the Philippines, or Adivasi tribes of India such as the Koraga, Irula, and Chenchu, who have almost no admixture from western Eurasia that would have been derived from the surrounding Indo-Aryan and Dravidian populations, and even these groups have varying appearance by tribe due to their relative isolation. Isolation. Keep in mind that the Dravidian and Indo-Aryan languages have a large amount of shared vocabulary due to thousands of years of contact, and there has been extensive intermarriage between these two people groups throughout their existence, with the ethnic groups of Tamil Nadu and the Sri Lankan Tamils having the highest degree of original Southern Eurasian admixture of the non adivasi Dravidian speaking groups, due not only to their geographic position, but various historic factors as well. An even more radical proposition actually posits that Dravidians might have had a linguistic and minor genetic connection to the Korean and Japanese languages from ancient Indian migrants, not really accepted by most mainstream linguists, yet with a surprisingly high amount of support from Korean and Japanese historians, and there's actually evidence of historical interactions between ancient Indians and these Northeast Asians dating back thousands of years. Although sometimes the issue of South Asian genetics and culture is simply Simplified by myself in the past as well, as simply North versus South, I would revise that to divide the subcontinent into roughly three regions instead. The South, genetically split between mostly the much older indigenous population and other ancient migrants from the Middle East. The Northwest, who have the largest amount of genetic similarity to Southwest Asia and highest degree of steppe Eurasian ancestry from the Indo-Aryan migration. And lastly, the Northeast who have a lesser degree of Western Eurasian admixture than the former, and far more Eastern Eurasian admixture than either group mentioned due to their proximity to the Orient. There will always be exceptions, however, due to the complexity of interregional migration, social pressures such as the caste system, and extensive intermixing over literally thousands of years. As I mentioned in an earlier video, South Asia is what Latin America would become in a couple thousand years, where virtually everyone would be interconnected to a certain extent, but there would still be genetic and cultural divisions. When it comes to the modern Dravidians of today, outside of southern India and northern Sri Lanka, there are still indigenous pockets scattered throughout northeast India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and even as far away as Pakistan and Afghanistan with the Brahui people bordering the Baluch and Pashtuns. However, due to extensive intermixing, this Dravidian-speaking group is almost entirely assimilated into the neighboring people groups, and many no longer consider themselves to be ethnically distinct. The groups in southern India, however, are still very much alive and vibrant, with the four main languages spoken being Kannada, Malayali, Telugu, and Tamil, although a plethora of much smaller languages and ethnic groups do exist, and as previously mentioned, this generally defines the region of southern India, although this is not without complications. Although the vast majority of Dravidian peoples are adherents to Hinduism, with Dravidian customs clearly being very influential in the founding of the religion, there are also considerable Christian and Muslim minorities. 
Interestingly, the Christians of the Malayali-speaking state of Kerala actually predate Christianization of some parts of Europe by over a thousand years and are the result of Syriac-speaking Orthodox Christians coming from the Middle East and settling in this region, although their genetic impact was relatively small and the community only uses the Syriac language in religious ceremonies. And there are an equally large number of Muslims in this region, especially Kerala as well, with many Dravidian-speaking Muslims Muslims in both India and Sri Lanka claiming ancestry from the Middle East, mostly Arabs or Persians. Although only making up around a quarter and fifth of Sri Lanka and India's populations respectively, a percentage which is dropping quickly in the latter due to lower birth rates, worldwide Dravidians number some 300 million, with a large diaspora outside their traditional region of settlement in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Malaysia and Singapore, South Africa, the Mascarene Archipelago, and more recently the Gulf Arab states. So in conclusion, some people claim that the Dravidians and Indo-Aryans of South Asia are one people, and from a cultural, religious, and historical standpoint, a case can be made. But in terms of genetics and appearance, the region is much more of a spectrum than anywhere else on Earth, perhaps having phenotypes of just near any group imaginable. Although the Dravidians may be a minority in the region today, they had an impact on just near every recognizable South Asian custom, tradition, and belief, and were instrumental in the development in the modern nations we see there today. So let me know your thoughts on the origins and development of India's most ancient surviving people, and their impact on the entirety of the subcontinent and beyond. And for today's poll, tell me which Dravidian diaspora group is the most interesting to you. And as always, thank you all for watching. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.